Yeah, I guess we could get started. It, it's 2.30 already. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jukka Titting. Um, I'm a developer at Adobe and a long-time contributor to, to Apache Jackrabbit. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Oak architecture, um, the, the Jackrabbit Oak project that we started a couple of years ago, or, or two years ago more specifically. Um, and this talk is, is mostly about um, the architecture uh, that we've come up with, um, not so much about like, like the, um, how you'd use it in practice or how, kind of, what are the main features and stuff like that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a talk uh, about um, content repositories in more generally later, later this afternoon. So, so if you're interested in how you could use a content repository, how it works and stuff like that, and that, that's more the talk to, to attend. And this one's more about, about kind of what's the new stuff, what it, how it behaves, and then what's the underlying architecture. So um, as I said uh, two years ago, basically, uh, we figured out that, that uh, the Jackrabbit architecture that, that we now have, it is kind of getting closer to, to the end of its life. Um, there are kind of major problems in, in, in scalability um, and, 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 and performance, especially to, with, with the kinds of, of use cases that we're seeing with, with lots of concurrent writes, very huge, huge um, amounts of content and so on. Um, and it was becoming obvious that, that something needed to be done. Um, and Oak is, is what we've done, basically. Uh, currently, like after these two years of, of the past two years of development, we've kind of uh, released 20 uh, alpha releases of Oak, um, and we're getting pretty close to, to doing a first 1.0 uh, production release. Um, it should be out within a month or so. Uh, and then, uh, based on that, how well that works, we're kind of targeting uh, to get Jackrabbit 3 out with Oak um, as, as a kind of um, key component inside that. Uh, for now, we'll probably do like another Jackrabbit 2.8 re release uh, without Oak and then kind of merge Oak 1.0 and then and, uh, current Jackrabbit 2.8 into Jackrabbit 3 uh, later on. So um, besides this presentation, there's quite a lot of stuff already uh, online available. Uh, if you're interested, I won't go through these in detail. You'll f find them in the slides um, later on. Um, I have quite a lot of stuff to go through. Uh, this is kind of just to give you an overview of, of, of the kinds of stuff that we'll, we'll be going through. Um, and, um, and I hope that, that we'll have enough time for, for, for all of this. So uh, let's start with the basics, um, the, the tree model. I um, assume most, at least most of you are already familiar with the JCR content repository model. It's basically a um, hierarchical uh, database where we have nodes uh, and each node has properties and so on. So here we have a basic, basic tree structure with, with uh, five nodes um, and each of the nodes is, is, is named uh, within its parent. So we have uh, the root node, we have node A, uh, we have node A slash B, and node A slash C, and, and, and then the D node there. So each node uh, is uniquely identified by its path. And that's kind of the key concept that we're using within Oak. Um, the path is always the primary identifier of a node. In Jackrabbit 2.x, um, or the Jackrabbit Classic, uh, we used identifiers like that were independent of the path of the node. So you could always access a node by identifier, and if you needed a needed its path, it then kind of traverse up the tree to the root. Uh, in Oak, we do it the opposite way. And uh, you'll see later on how this, this um, becomes useful. So, um, so far so good. Um, what about uh, if we start updating the tree? Um, we have a user that, that's hardly visible up there, but he's there. Um, and say someone comes along, and hey, I'm going to update these two nodes here. 
I'm going to make some changes here uh, and add another node here. Um, so far, so good. Uh, the problem is that now um, the first user is, is confused. Like, I was reading this tree. I was reading notes from there and content. Uh, and now suddenly it's different from what I saw before. Um, that's the current behavior in Chakravit uh, 2. Um, and while it works, uh, it's a little bit troublesome for, for some use cases. And what's more important is that these kinds of state transitions, um, if they kind of, if we want them to be visible to all users at the same time, they end up being a huge concurrency bottleneck. So what we wanted to do in Oak is to resolve this case. And this is really the key to understanding how Oak works. So uh, instead of like, like making this first user suddenly start seeing uh, new content uh, come up from, from concurrent users, uh, we actually make a new revision of the tree so that um, the first user still sees the original content that, that they were accessing. Nothing changes. They're happy using that content and, and will use, use it until they're, they're ready to move on. Uh, meanwhile, the other user, uh, here are the notes that, that uh, he modified and added. And then we make a new version of the root node with the reference to this subtree that, that wasn't modified. So to this user, it looks like just another normal tree, uh, just like in here, just that the content is slightly different. And these are the kind of revisions that we're tracking. Um, you might notice that this is pretty much similar to what you'd see in, in a version control system like, like Git or Subversion. That's, that's one of the, the key motivations on, on how we're doing this. Uh, also, if, you are, if you're familiar with database technology in general, uh, this is uh, like similar to, to the uh, multi-version concurrency control technique uh, used there. So um, we give names or kind of identifiers to these different revisions. So here I call this first revision uh, revision one and the second one revision two. And then all of these nodes, uh, instead of just using the path that it has, uh, we can use uh, the revision plus the path to identify a specific state of that node. So here I have uh, the original state of this node uh, would be identified by revision one and then the path slash d. And the modified state would be then revision two slash d. And this is uh, kind of how Oak internally uh, interprets like, like what's the current state of this node. And then uh, here we have this unmodified subtree. The path is the same uh, and both revisions point to the same state of that node. So we don't actually have to kind of copy over all the content all the time, just, just the modified bits. And in addition, we keep track of the latest state of the repository, so that would be the head revision. Uh, by the way, uh, I hope we have a couple of minutes for questions at the end. But if something's unclear and you don't catch it, I'm going at a pretty rapid pace here, so just, just let me know. and. and We'll cover that in more detail. So um, now we have the, this uh, revisions, how we go from one revision to another. Um, in Oak, uh, that's an explicit operation. In Chakrabi 2, like, like you'd always see the latest state, uh, but with Oak, uh, you do an explicit refresh. Of course, for backwards compatibility for JCR clients, we have this auto refresh mode that simulates uh, how Jackrabbit 2 works. But basically, under the hood, uh, it's always an explicit refresh operation. And here's how it works. You kind of basically say that now I want to refresh. You get a new revision, and then you start reading, reading that revision. And once you've done that, uh, this becomes your new tree that you're seeing. And since you no longer have access to this old revision, the repository knows that, OK, now it's now it's gone, uh, no one can see that content anymore. We can treat it as garbage and collect it. And that's a key difference to, to, to version control systems that are designed to never lose past revisions. Uh, in here, we don't really care like if you're updating 
a counter a thousand times a second, we don't really care what happened uh, on each of those updates as long as no, no user is anymore uh, accessing that revision. So, so we're able to kind of scale out to such uh, very frequent updates by, by allowing like unused content to be, to be garbage collected. So um, then the garbage collector runs, the, the garbage gets, gets thrown away, and then here we are. It's, it's a very similar situation as we started with, but now uh, the tree looks a little bit different. So um, this is all simple so far. It's just kind of a single threaded, uh, a single update at a time case. Um, what happens if, if we're having lots of users making changes at the same time? So uh, let's consider uh, an example. Here we have, again, the same base revision we started with earlier. Uh, we have some user uh, who comes in and removes this node. So basically what he'd end up seeing is, okay, uh, this part remains the same. This part is now modified because that child node no longer exists, but this uh, other child node is, is still the same. So we have this modified node that points to that child and the root points to here and here. And uh, another concurrent user um, comes in and makes the similar change as, as we saw before. Uh, so adding another child node there uh, to the other, other subtree. Now, um, this one gets a little bit confused. Uh, so let's look at it in a little bit different way. So, um, here we have time going uh, um, from left to right. Um, start with here, then uh, one change goes to here, and another change goes to here. And this is something that could happen on different cluster nodes. It could happen in different data centers uh, in different parts of the world. Um, you could, uh, in theory, even have a repository that you have a copy of um, on your laptop, and you make some changes there, um, and this is what you see there, and this is the master copy of the repository. Um, basically what you do if, if you clone a Git repository, you'd have uh, a similar case here. And then later on, um, at some point in future, um, these different revisions are merged together. So we look at both of these changes and the, the, the shared base state from which they started. And then we apply, kind of merge those changes together. And this is a simple case since we know that, okay, uh, this one only has changes in that subtree, and this one only has changes in that subtree. So we can take that change from here, and that change from here, and then just rewrite the root node to point to those uh, different subtrees. So that's a fairly simple case still. Um, but when things get more complicated, we need a little bit more, more complex stra strategies. So here's um, kind of a, in the order of from, from simple to more advanced, the different ways of how we could deal with this. Uh, well, the simple case is, is that, okay, we don't allow concurrent changes. We just allow one change after another. Uh, if there are concurrent changes, uh, we do, um, a similar operation as, 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 as is done with Git rebase, that we just take those changes and try to reapply them on top of the latest state of the repository. And if they work without conflicts, then we're fine. If they don't, then we just, just fail that commit. Um, that's simple uh, and straightforward. Unfortunately, it comes with a very uh, big uh, concurrency bottleneck. Oops. Uh, and the second one, uh, we can optimize that a little bit uh, instead of using one big lock on the entire repository, we could use lock on each subtree separately. So as long as we can ensure that, that two commits, like what we have had uh, in the previous slide, only modify uh, separate distinct subtrees, then we could let those, those commits go on uh, concurrently and, and the merge is, is guaranteed to, to succeed without problems. Um, and only if, if like I have two uh, clients working on the same nodes, modifying the same nodes at the same time, then those, those changes would be serialized. 
so that's an improvement uh, and it work, works fairly well in practice uh, for, for many use cases. And then kind of if, if we go really uh, to, to the far end of, 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 of removing all concurrency um, bottlenecks, um, we, we have to deal with these merge logic uh, cases. So how do we merge changes when it's no longer possible to, to make one change fail and let the client deal with the problem? Uh, so the client might have already, okay, I committed this and somewhere, someone somewhere else committed something else and they've all gone uh, and left, left their computers and, and terminated their sessions and basically for, for all they care, everything's already done. But then the repository starts merging things back together um, and, um, and then we have a conflict. Um, so one way, one way of dealing with that, um, and that's what, for example, uh, CouchDB is doing, is to have these conflict markers that, okay, now we had a conflict that we couldn't automatically merge together. Uh, we need help from the user. We'll just mark that, okay, here's something happened. This is my best effort of what it should look like, but I'm keeping the, the, the conflict thing changes around until someone with more brains can, can come up and, uh, and figure out what, what really happened and what should be the, the proper resolution for this. Um, and then finally, we could do away with that and just kind of allow the repository to, in all cases, merge the changes. Even if like, like I set the property to A and I, you set the property to, to B, uh, and then, for example, we'll just take the one that, that came in latest or something like that. Um, that works, oh, but the unfortunate part about that is that then kind of that my change to A is, is, is lost and I can't go back to it anymore if I don't have a uh, reference to that revision that I made. So. So these are basically all the options that, that, that the architecture itself has. Um, but uh, before we go further, let's, let's take a look at how we're actually currently implementing these bits. Because we don't do all of this. Uh, for now, we only implement the first two options of conflict resolution. So uh, uh, full synchronization and partial synchronization. Uh, but later on, I would expect that, that, that at some point we want to implement these, these merge uh, cases as well. So um, in Oak, uh, we have this, this concept of, of a microkernel. Uh, the naming is a little bit uh, confused because we're, we ended up mixing uh, architectural component names and, and, and Java interface names. Um, uh, so so you, you see these things are referred to as the microkernel or the node store uh, at various times. Um, I prefer to use the microkernel as, as the, the kind of name of the architectural uh, layer or component, uh, and then kind of use node store where re when referring to the actual uh, Java code that implements that. So uh, this bit is, is, is uh, the component that's re responsible for, for actually implementing all these operations that, that I described uh, earlier. Uh, and also keeping, keeping track of stuff like clustering and sorting, uh, caching of the content and so on. Um, but uh, it doesn't care about any higher level concerns. Uh, like you can commit anything to a microkernel. It, it just co is concerned about whether there was a conflict. Um, if there's some type, kind of validation, access controls and stuff like that that you want to uh, deal with, then, then it's uh, taken care of higher up. Um, also stuff like search indexes and stuff like that are handled higher up. So it basically is just, just a kind of free uh, implementation. And what we have now, we have two main uh, microkernels. Uh, one is called the document microkernel. Uh, it started as, as the Mongo microkernel. Um, uh, so you at times still see references to, to that name. But nowadays it, it's implemented on both uh, MongoDB and on, on generic uh, relational databases using JDBC. Though the JDBC support is still uh, a work in progress, it's, it's not yet uh, ready for production. It, it doesn't perform too well at the moment. And then the other one is, is called the segment MK. Um, and currently it's backed only by, by the local file system. 
Uh, so, and, and for that, uh, we use the term tar mk because it, the, the file system is, we use tar files as, as the storage format. Um, so um, how these things differ? Um, well, the conflict handling um, and, and, and scalability of the document mk is better. Basically leverages MongoDB or the relational database uh, underneath for, for a lot of these this, uh, high-end features like clustering, sharding, and so on. Um, and it can also kind of do this parcel ser serialization of commits so that only those commits that actually modify the same nodes end up uh, being serialized uh, across the cluster. Otherwise, if you're adding a comment there, modifying uh, that page there, and, and adding or removing a, a file in that, that other area of the repository, those all changes can, can happen concurrently, which is pretty nice. Um, unfortunately, uh, since all of the traffic is, is, is sent over the network, uh, or at least, least um, uh, sent to a separate process in the same, same computer, um, the performance isn't, isn't that great for, uh, like, if you just want as fast as possible, uh, like, I, I don't care about clustering, I don't care about sharding, I just want a single node a single node repository that, that's optimized for performance, um, then the document MK isn't, isn't um, the optimum case. For that case, uh, the tar MK uh, is, is, is uh, often better. So as you can kind of probably infer from that, the, the key use cases for these two different backends are, are somewhat separate, uh, and that's actually why we do have these different backends that kind of since you have different use cases, you can, you can select the best backend for, for your needs. And um, later on, I would assume that, that um, uh, like these existing implementations will, will address some of the, the shortcomings that are currently there. Um, for example, the segment MK uh, could be extended to support clustering natively. And the document MK has quite a lot of uh, room for performance improvement, also for the single node case. So, and and it's it's quite likely that at some point someone wants to implement uh, a microkernel based on, say, Hadoop or or uh, EC2 um, uh, stuff. So, um, back to the architecture from from these implementation bits. Um, how would we handle uh, like different replication and sharding cases um, with this architecture? Well, the replicas stuff is, is pretty straightforward. You could just, just replicate the entire repository and then have copies of it. Um, and the nice thing is that since, since each of these specific revisions are immutable, like you only ever add new revisions uh, of the repository, you don't really kind of, if you have a, a, a full replica, here uh, that has uh, some revisions, you never have to invalidate those. Like never, like this one never changes, so you don't have to tell that, okay, now this changed. The only time you have to tell something to the replica is that, okay, now I have new uh, revisions. Um, and then the replica can request those uh, and do independent garbage collection in here. Uh, kind of a similar case is, is you could have a kind of a parcel replica that, that acts as a cache uh, that only reads parts of the repository or, or, or a specific revision. Uh, for example, if only the subtree of, of the tree uh, content repository is, is frequently accessed, then we don't really need to replicate the whole revision to a, to a cache node, just kind of those parts that are, are frequently accessed. Um, and for sharding, um, there's a, a number of different, different ways how, how this um, tree structure could be sharded. Um, the most straightforward way would be to kind of just use the path of a node to determine where uh, on which shard uh, that, that content is going to be stored. Um, it's simple and straightforward. Unfortunately, um, and commonly, like you have some subtrees that are really large and others that are really small, so it doesn't work that well uh, in practice. 
a very similar uh, approach that, that we tried at, at one point uh, with, with the document MK uh, based on MongoDB is to kind of use the depth of the path for sharding. But that becomes even more troublesome since kind of the deeper you are in the tree, typically the more content you have. So you ended up with one shard having a huge amount of content and then the top level shard having just one node uh, and different revisions of that. Um, uh, of course, like the higher up on the tree you are, the more revisions you are going to have uh, since kind of the root is, is given a new revision on each commit, uh, whereas a node like here is, is only uh, given a new revision when, when it specifically is changed. But garbage collection keeps the, the, the number of revisions to, to a reasonable amount, so um, that didn't work that well. So currently what we use is, is kind of we just hash uh, the path of the node and use the hash to determine that, okay, um, uh, this path uh, or, or this, I know that this path is going to be stored uh, on this chart. <coughs> Currently, we don't use the revision as a part of the, the hash key, but that could also be done. Um, I'm not sure whether that, that will be useful or not. Using just the path is, is kind of simple and straightforward since that's what, what uh, normal users are using to find, find the node. And then there's uh, an additional um, idea that isn't currently implemented. Um, since all of the nodes are accessed by, by traversing uh, the path, um, it's a little bit troublesome. Like if I want to access this node, I have to first go to this shard to get this node, and then this shard to get this node, and then the third shard um, to get that node. So we could go back to the replica idea uh, of caching and actually allow uh, each shard to cache those parent nodes that are being accessed. Um, and since frequently like um, the lower level of levels of the tree contain the most content, uh, caching the parents is, is pretty, uh, pretty cheap. So this allows that, that kind of accessing each of these nodes only requires accessing a single shard. So if, if we want to access this node, we get uh, the cached root node from here and the, this cast node from here, and then, then that uh, node from, from the same chart. And the same thing for here, uh, everything's cast up to that point. Okay, um, access control is a pretty tricky feature to implement efficiently, um, but it's also a pretty uh, prominent feature in the content repository. Um, it, it's for, for many use cases uh, a kind of um, a killer feature um, since uh, implementing very fine-grained uh, access control on, on other types of databases is often uh, quite tricky, especially if you want to combine not just kind of individual document level access control uh, with also broader, like, okay, I want this every uh, bit of content within this subtree or within this, this collection to be accessed, controlled by, by these rules. That becomes pretty, pretty uh, tough to do. Uh, we pretty much solved this in Oak, uh, and, and uh, the model we're using is this kind of, um, we allow certain um, nodes to become invisible if they're read protected. So, uh, Say this user has access to these three nodes, um, but not these ones. Uh, this kind of brings up a little bit tricky case. Like, like if I want to access node uh, slash a slash b that's here, I have to go through this node. Um, um, and um, implementation wise, um, it would have been easier uh, to kind of just say that, okay, if you can't access a node, and you can access nothing below it. Um, but we actually had a pretty strong use case for, for these kinds of cases as well. So what we ended up doing is, is to allow this. Um, <coughs> and the way we're doing it, um, so here's a list of the paths that, that are accessible in this case. We added this concept of, of existence of a node. So um, you can access basically any path in the system but the resulting node by traversing that path doesn't necessarily exist. 
It actually makes the, the, the architecture pretty clean. There's no need to, to worry about like null return values or exceptions because of uh, uh, path not found uh, cases. All paths are always uh, referent or traversable. And only once you get the resulting node, you ac ask that node whether, whether you actually do exist. Um, so this is pretty, pretty simple and straightforward, and it, it, it implements this, this access control model pretty well. Um, and it, it, it's uh, currently implemented on top of the microkernel. It, it fits pretty well uh, as, as just a fairly, fairly low uh, or kind of a thin decorator level um, on top of the, the, the microkernel. So um, some other important features. Uh, this is actually the key uh, to a lot of the, the higher level functionality. Um, we want the mechanism of, of telling, basically uh, comparing two different revisions uh, so that we know that, okay, in this, going from this revision to that other one, uh, what actually did change. Um, it's equivalent to doing a diff uh, on a version control system. Uh, and that's what we call, it's the content diff. Um, and um, having that functionality allows us to do a lot of the, the higher level stuff that the microkernel doesn't actually implement. <coughs> so we can do validation by, okay, telling what actually changed, uh, and then we validate just those bits of the content. Otherwise, we'd have to kind of traverse the whole, whole repository all the time whenever something changed to ver verify that, okay, these, these um, consistency rules or other validation rules are still being met. Um, so here's a kind of a quick example of, of how this content diff works. Um, basically, we start with the root node. Um, we compare, uh, for example, in this case, and then the diff uh, determines that, okay, something changed here. The change doesn't need, need to necessarily be directly on this node, like a property change or something like that, or a child node being, being added or removed. Uh, in this case, that is the case though. Uh, whenever anything within that subtree is changed, uh, we're notified that, okay, something changed there. Uh, and then uh, as a second step, as we then uh, step through and come to this level, uh, we're then notified that, okay, at this level, uh, that node, actually this node, was removed. So we get a B child node was removed again um, in, in the diff. And similarly, uh, when going from here to here, um, we, we get uh, information that, okay, this, this extra child node was added. And the diff is generic, uh, so we can basically compare, we could even go, go from here to here and compare these two revisions or uh, we can go from, from here to here uh, and compare these ones. Um, and, and basically, just like you could do, take two, any two files and run a diff against them and then figure out how they, are, how they differ. <coughs> <coughs> of course, the underlying implementation in the microkernel that runs this diff is heavily optimized for the case where kind of you compare a previous revision to a future revision, uh, which is what we most of the time are doing. And, and, and that also kind of governs a lot of the, the internal uh, implementation details of the microkernel. We need to be able to do these uh, diff operations very efficiently. And what we use these diffs for? Uh, well, the commit hooks are, are a key uh, user of, of, of these diffs. So what a commit hook does, that's basically the key plugin interface in, in Oak. Um, it allows you, us to kind of, when we're changing something, when we're making a new change like what we're doing there here, we're trying to, like before that, that change is actually persisted and made available to other clients, um, we have a commit hook um, that can tell that, okay, given this kind of change, actually persist this, this content instead. So in this case, we take like, okay, we leave this subtree unmodified, but actually when you added a new node here, um, say we have a rule that, okay, all the children uh, under this node should come in duplicates. So 
we actually duplicate that node here. Or it could be basically anything. Uh, so this is a very powerful concept. Um, it allows uh, us to do kind of modify the content in, uh, in flight uh, as it's being uh, committed to the repository and also do all sorts of validation and other, other uh, checks on the content. And only once the commit hook says that, okay, now I'm done, here's the re uh, revision that, that should be shared with other uses, users, will the repository then, then do that uh, and actually persist uh, those changes and make them available. So um, to repeat, um, what the commit hook can do, basically, it can tell that, okay, this change is not acceptable. For example, you're breaking some, some typing rules. You're, you're trying to write uh, content that you don't have write access to, to modify um, or, or something different. Uh, there's a whole lot of, of, of validation uh, components in, in Oak that, that do these kinds of checks uh, to implement like higher level contracts. Um, the nice thing is that, that you can mix and match those. If you have a use case where you don't really care about specific types of, of checks, you can just leave that commit hook out and then, then your system will, will not care about that. Um, we can tell, tell that, okay, the commit is fine like this, we'll just, just pass it along, <coughs> make no changes to it, or then we can modify the, the commit uh, in, in whatever way we want, and that's very useful for, for, for many things. And as I said, most of the time, uh, these commit hooks le do leverage the content diff. And um, here's a few examples of, of, of what we're doing with, with the content diffs. Um, since this is such a powerful, uh, powerful concept, uh, it's also uh, somewhat easy to, to misuse uh, or use in ways that, that don't really perform very well. Uh, basically, uh, what you have with these commit hooks, like if you configure 10 commit hooks in the system, uh, the repository will apply them one after another. Um, and if each one of them does the content diff or traverses the tree, uh, then that's not gonna perform. Um, so even though it is very powerful uh, and it's fairly simple to, to use um, uh, in practice, it often comes with a pretty high performance impact. So we came up with these two extra uh, interfaces that are basically commit hooks in disguise, an editor um, and a validator. And the way these ones work is that we do just one content diff in one big generic hook. And then we use this editor and validator components to basically we run callbacks to them um, so that, okay, uh, what should I do when this piece of content changed? when this, this child node was added or this property was modified. Uh, and then we ask its, its editor and validator to, to check that specific change. And that allows to run, us to run just one diff across the changes and have lots of different kinds of functionality uh, um, applied to that, that change. So <clears throat> that's a useful mechanism. The only drawback uh, uh, for this and then the reason why not all of the, the commit hooks are done like this, is that, that you, know, you always use the content diff and, and the programming model for that is a little bit uh, convoluted since, since you're getting callbacks instead of being in control of what happens. So it takes, takes a little bit getting used to, 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 to understand that. So um, that's the, the, the story about commit hooks. Um, another related uh, set of components uh, that are also pluggable are observers um, that basically work a little bit like commit hooks. They're given the same arguments like, okay, this was the revision before and this is the revision after uh, and then they can do a content diff to figure out what changed uh, in between. But uh, they're run after the fact. fact. So once change is already there in the repository, uh, is the observer uh, invoked. Um, and if the change is coming from, from another part of the cluster, uh, then uh, it's not necessary that that content change is actually a single commit. It could be a set of multiple commits that we only just see that, okay, 
Uh, this is what we had before, and now after merging all of those commits, we're seeing this different state of the repository. And there might be no, no way to get to the individual commits in between. They could already be garbage collected on the other cluster now. Um, so basically, um, you're only given information that, okay, something has changed. Uh, you don't necessarily know who changed that and, and, and in what order. Um, there is um, a kind of an exception to this rule. Uh, currently, both of the, the microkernels that we have do support um, uh, like giving the observers information, more information about commits that happen locally on that cluster node. So when that happens, uh, we guarantee that all of the, the commits are, are uh, reported as individual sets of changes, and, and we also give some, some extra information, like who was the user that made this commit, and, and what were the, the parameters that, that were used, and so on. <coughs> What's the timestamp of this change, and so on. <coughs> so it's not a hard and fast rule, but, but generally if you want to do a generic observer, then kind of the best you get is just, just to kind of, you can tell like when something changed, um, and, and what's the latest state of the repository. Um, and that's, that's useful for, for things like um, uh, updating uh, an index that's not stored inside the repository. So for example, we have an indexing component that, that uh, stores the index in an external solar server. So we can have an observer that's just kind of, okay, whenever something changes in the repository, uh, we'll send those changes to solar and have them indexed there. And if you have some kind of a cache, you could use that um, to, to invalidate entries when you know that, okay, this, this content has changed. We need to, to recalculate those, those cache entries and so on. It's useful for logging, like, okay, I want to know that this changed. Uh, I don't really need to log them when the changes are happening. And that's also a kind of a key difference between observers and commit hooks is that observers always tell something that actually did happen. A commit hook, on the other hand, could be given a change that never actually gets persisted. So if I have two commit hooks, the first one runs without changes or kind of without problems, and then to that commit hook everything looks fine, but then the second commit hook says that, okay, this commit is going to be rejected. Um, then it could be like if, if I implement something like logging or, or, or cache invalidation in the first commit hook, then it could be that, okay, it, it, it saw some changes that actually never never really happened, except in this failed commit. Yeah. Um, I have a bit more information on this now, I think. Uh, on top of that, they have two clusters. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Later, they have two yeah. clusters. Yeah. Germany keeps yeah. the ordering on, yeah. on the changes. Uh, this is not necessarily the order, but that's the number yeah. of the kind of order. There, there is like, um, an observer is, is, is guaranteed to see um, a linear sequence of events. It doesn't necessarily match to the exact sequence that actually happened in each of the cluster nodes or, or even on that, that specific node. It could be that some of the changes are collapsed together and you can't tell that, okay, like if, if on a single uh, observed change, uh, subtree A changed and subtree D changed, you can't really tell like which change came before the other ones. It's just kind of one, okay, this happened at some point between these, these times. But you don't get them out of order. You don't get them out of order. You won't be given that, okay, um, uh, node D changed and then node A changed. Uh, if there is some point in, in between where you can observe like, like reading the repository on that cluster node that A changed but D didn't yet say. Uh, but uh, if you have a clustered system, it could be that the other change actually did happen before in real time. It just took a long while to be the merge back to, to the other cluster node. And in that, that case, like the sequence of changes you see on that cluster node would be valid only as, as far as that specific cluster node is, is, is concerned. So, yeah. 
but what we guarantee that eventually they'll they'll all end up with the same state. Yeah. 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 So, so here we only kind of we guarantee that that within a single cluster node, when you are reading the repository, <coughs> the states you are seeing uh, are consistent with the order you're you're observing through an observer. So. So basically, nothing becomes visible to you uh, before it is being sent to an observer, as well. So, so that that's the guarantee, but it's not as strong as as with journal observation in 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 Jackrabbit two. Okay, quickly about search. Um, so um, search is pretty different uh, in Oak than it was in in, in Jackrabbit two. Basically, how it deal with these kinds of, uh, we still support the same query languages, the same query syntax. Um, how this is done, uh, we have a set of parser components. You could add, plug in a new language. Uh, for example, you, you might want to, to implement Google style queries or, 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 or some, some whatever uh, query syntax that you want. Uh, and what the query engine first does, uh, it figures out, okay, which language is this uh, query is in. Uh, let's select the correct parser, and then we'll have an internal query object. And then uh, we'll take that query object and send it to, to various index plugins that, that index separate uh, areas of the repository or separate aspects of the repository. And these are all configurable uh, and pluggable. So you could say that, okay, I want an index on all the node types of, of each node, or I want the, the index on the JCR last modified property of the nodes, or I want a full text index that contains everything in this specific subtree, for example. Um, or it could be that, that there's no matching index, in which case we fall back to this, this traversal index implementation that just kind of doesn't look things up from an index, it just kind of traverses the entire repository looking for matches. And that's horribly slow, but it's guaranteed to give you the results you're asking for. So, we ask each of the configured indexes uh, for an estimate of the cost of, okay, if I were to run this query against the index that you have here, uh, how much time would that take? Give an estimate. And then we just select the, the index that has the lowest estimate of, of how, how uh, much time this, this index is going to cost. And, um, and then we run the query against that index uh, and we get a set of results and so on. Here's the same thing in, in a little bit more detail. Um, at the last step, uh, we do still extra processing. Since the indexes don't really contain uh, access control information, we still have to recheck each of the results that, okay, whether this user actually is allowed to see these things. Also, currently, the indexes don't support uh, uh, grouping or faceting of the results, unfortunately. Uh, so we have to do those as, as a post-processing step, which is um, a bit unfortunate. We did add sorting, though, uh, to the implementation already, and at some point I hope uh, we'll, we'll do uh, something on the other features as well. Here's a list of the implementations that we currently have. I won't go into too much detail in, on them. Um, and then uh, to kind of, before we close up, just to give you a big picture of, of kind of how these bits fit together. Um, at the bottom uh, of the stack, we have these microkernels. Uh, they implement this tree uh, model, uh, basically. And there's this node store interface. Uh, it's a Java API uh, for, for accessing the content. Uh, and then we have a component called Oak Core um, that takes care of the access controls and, and the search and, and all those features uh, with the help of all of these, these um, uh, commit hook plug plugins and other plugins uh, that we have. And it provides this, this fairly simple uh, Oak API. It's basically a very, very simplified version of JCR. Um, and that's kind of optimized for, for the specific content structure. Um, uh, let's go the other way around. And then on top of that, uh, we have the JCR component and it then implements the JCR API as uh, backwards compatibly as, as possible uh, on top of this, this Oak stack. Um, but kind of 
if you have a new application, um, you then have a choice whether you want to use JCR and all the extra tooling that comes with it um, and all the, the extra functionality that we have implemented on that level or <coughs> if you're only implement, interested in, in the lower level functionality, you could decide to go directly to the Oak API. And what we currently haven't yet implemented, but or kind of have a very draft implementation in here is that uh, we plan to have a, kind of a direct HTTP uh, API uh, that comes uh, as here, so it doesn't have to go through the JCR API like the current uh, DevX remoting that we have. And the benefits of doing it at that level uh, instead of going through the JCR API is that we can get quite a lot of extra performance and features out of that. And then uh, to keep the picture complete, there's all these plugin uh, interfaces that we have. Um, and they, those allow kind of basically all levels of the stack to be customized. Uh, most of the plugins work at this level but there are plugins for the microkernels and then some plugins also for the JCR level. So if you want to customize uh, the behavior of the stack or basically take away some of the, the default functionality that we have there, like access controls, I don't care about that and I just take away that plugin uh, and it works pretty well. I think we're two minutes over time, but there's still eight minutes before the next session. So if you have some quick questions, um, I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, I'll be around. Yeah. Um, just with the garbage collection we yeah. talked about earlier, is that a memory garbage collection, like Java garbage collection, or are you talking about persistence? Persistence. Okay. So um, those, well, it depends on the back end, but basically sure. those revisions will get persisted uh, once they are shared to other clients. For JCR level versioning, uh, when we make a version of a specific node, what happens is that we actually make a copy, or it's basically a copy by, copy on re by reference, but it's 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 uh, logically it's a copy of, of that piece of content. So um, if the original piece of content is no longer accessible from a revision, but um, but the the version uh, checked in version of it is is uh, still accessible then we can still garbage collect that, that revision, but since those pieces of content are still being referenced from, from the version history, those bits are still preserved uh, on the disk or, or in, in Mongo or wherever they're stored. We don't support that. Okay. So there are some features in Oak that we explicitly don't support. There's kind of limited support for same name siblings. If you have content that, that uses same name siblings uh, we, and you import them, uh, then we basically make like just use the, the, the suffix, like the index suffix and make that part of the name within Oak. <laughs> kind of works, but it's not real same name siblings. Yeah. Uh, all of the children with their identification get changed. Yes. Uh, while before you still had to yeah. identify Yeah. So what kind of now? Well, that's again kind of depends on, on the back end. Um, like for a JCR client, um, if you make a node referenceable so it has a visible JCR UUID, then that JCR UUID is still there you can still use it to access the node. Uh, we have a separate index that maps that UUID to the path that's currently valid. So, so it's fairly efficient. But, um, but internally, when you do that, um, currently the, the tar MK can do that very efficiently since internally it, it's just like copied by reference. Um, uh, the, the document MK has, has, has more trouble with that because it does this parcel uh, synchronization so it kind of needs to know the path of each node and when you move a subtree it needs to update the path of each of the nodes. So that's a fairly expensive operation uh, with that backend. Okay, uh, I think we're, we're out of time. So thanks everyone. <laughs>